Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. I pray through the intercession of Saint Dominic, the patron saint of preachers, that he would intercede now for the Lord's words to be spoken with power and love. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. The word Hashem in Hebrew means the name. For Jews, the name of God contains the full presence of the person. I read from Psalm number 9. I sing to your name, O Most High. My enemies are in retreat. They stumble and perish at your presence. So the eternal, the immense, the infinite, the immutable, the unchangeable God the all-present, the all-knowing, the all-powerful God is present in the name. Aquinas says this, it is from the name that power goes forth to effect the miraculous. The name is the source, the origin, the font from which the power flows. You cannot separate the name from the power. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I will give you. In the name of Jesus the Nazarene, walk. And the response from the Jewish rulers, by what power? And by whose name have you men done this. Peter replies, only in him is there salvation. For all the names in the world, this is the only one by which we can be saved. Let us threaten them against ever speaking to anyone in this name again. You see, the Jews held the name, the presence of God was in the name. So they did not want the name said because they associated the power of the healing with the cripple with the name of Jesus. So if they stop the church, if they stop Peter and the apostles speaking in the name, the power will go problem solved. This was their thinking. This is what Jesus said in Mark's Gospel. These are the signs that will be associated with believers. In my name, Hashem, they will cast out devils. They will have the gift of tongues. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will be cured. The name, the Hashem, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The power is the third person of the Holy Trinity, the personification of love, the Holy Spirit. The primary role of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify. He is called the sanctifier. This means to make holy, to clean, to purgate, to make pure. Purify me with hyssop until I am clean. Wash me until I am whiter than snow. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into complete truth. 
You could say that another way. When the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into Christ. Because Christ is the truth. Into Christ, incorporated into, into Christ. Configured into Christ. Transformed into Christ because we are the body of Christ so we are being sanctified. From the moment we are baptised, we enter the Trinitarian life and we are be being made holy. And this holiness will be completed upon our death and then through purgatory, a place of preparation to enter into the presence of God. This configuring, the conforming, we are asked through baptism to participate, to cooperate, to collaborate, to dinner date, Eucharist. I like that one. Divine grace, we receive divine grace when baptized, working with human nature, and the church doctrinally calls this a synergistical, a synergy of two nations, divine and human coming together, working together. It's where we get the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, um, understanding, counsel, knowledge, fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord, working with faith, hope, and charity, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. <laughs> Woo! Producing, what, do, what grows on trees? Fruit, love, joy, peace. And, and, and what do those fruits produce? Attitude, beatitude. So, so the spiritual gifts are linked to the virtues which produce fruit, which produces an attitude, beatitude. Check it out. Thomas Aquinas writes amazingly about it. The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. Amen? Amen. And St. Paul writes, let the renewing of your minds transform you. You know, but all of these sort of uh, adultery and murder and, and uh, all these things are going on in Emmerdale and it's going into your mind. Yeah. It's affecting you. It's, it's forming you in the way that Christ wants to form you in another way. The media and the enemy are forming you in the way they want you to be. They don't want you to be the body of Christ. They want you to be the body of the enemy. And so Miles knew this. He said to me once, you need healing. He could see these things. And he didn't push me away. He drew me towards him. Because he could have thought, well, if this guy needs healing, I can't trust him. But he didn't. He reached out to me. And we were, me, John, uh, we sat with Miles a lot. And he, I was sat on his little uh, stool thing that he used to put his feet up onto. I sat right in front of him. And he started praying over me. And when his hands were on my head, it was like a nail gun. <laughs> like darts going in my head. And I said, hey, Miles, it's hurting. And he said, I'll carry on. <laughs> yeah? and, and it must have went on for 20 minutes. But after a while, the pain left. And I knew I was being delivered of the wrong ways of thinking. I wasn't thinking like Christ, I was thinking like man. But Christ was giving me his mind through a holy man in faith, delivering me from the rubbish that I had allowed myself to watch, to see, to listen to, listening to negative people. Are there any negative people in here? <laughs> if it's windy tomorrow, praise the Lord. We, we want the wind of the Holy Spirit in here tonight. So Lord, can you... Can you send it sooner? We are also asked for our hearts to be circumcised. St. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 2. And it's the Holy Spirit who circumcises the heart. So I just briefly want to cover the sanctifying grace. So we've looked at that and charismatic grace. And what's the relationship between them? Aquinas says that sanctifying grace is what we receive in baptism to make us holy, ordains man immediately to union with God. 
Whereas charismatic grace prepares man for union with God. Father Cantalamessa says it like this. There is absolute priority with sanctifying action of the Holy Spirit over the charismatic grace. Because sanctifying grace has a permanent benefit. Charismatic grace has a temporary benefit. Let me explain. When Lazarus was brought back to life, did he die again? Yes. So the, the miracle of bringing him back to life, he still died. So it's temporary in that sense. But when a person is baptised and transformed and configured into complete truth, into Christ, it's permanent because it's for eternity in heaven. So the charismatic grace is given to the church for mission, for evangelization, to bring people back into baptism to, to be sanctified and made holy. And that is the priority that Cantor Messer is speaking about. Cantor Messer is the preacher to the papal household. And he knows what he's talking about. He also adds that charismatic grace action must be grounded in holiness. If the charisms are at work in us, then if we're not holy, our prophesying will become corrupted. This is what Cantor Lemessa is saying. Our words of knowledge will be not knowledge, they'll be useless if we're not holy. Our words of wisdom will not be wise at all. Any healing that takes place will not take place by God. The saints show us that holiness is the source, is the conduit for the charisms. This is an important point. Miles laboured on this for years. Holiness is the key. Because from holiness, God works through holy people. With his power, with his charisms. He's not bound by that. He can still work through people who are not holy when he chooses to. But Cantor Lamessa is saying, we need to be holy or else the charisms get corrupted. Examples of per personal holiness is the lives of the saints. We should study the lives of the saints because they show us what the process is, what we have to do in this cooperating, participating, dinner dating. They show us how to be. They give us excellent examples. Saint Faustina is one of my favourite saints. I named my daughter, she's here, Maria Faustina. 25, 26 years ago. Last March, I was invited to attend a, a, a lot of, give 16 talks in five days in Poland. And in one of the cities, uh, I was staying with a priest. And when I got up in the morning, uh, the, the, the priest said, do you want to visit a private chapel where there are four first class relics of saints? So from left to right, as you look at it, we had St. John Paul II, St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Anthony of Padua, and guess what? St. Faustina. So I was like, oh, I, seriously. I said to the, to the lad who was bringing me in, it was just nothing to him because he sees them all the time. But I said, which one shall I go for? So I ran straight to St. Faustina because my daughter, Maria, at that time was six months pregnant and she was having difficulties in the pregnancy. And so I, I grabbed hold of the, the, the relic and I prayed in faith, simple faith. It doesn't have to be theological. I just said, St. Faustina, if it's possible, if it's the Lord's will, can you please go and speak to Maria and give her some words of encouragement for the pregnancy? I put that on the um, family group on the social media because we're all connected together. And she put back, um, Dad, you're not going to believe it. At five to seven this morning, it was five to eight in Poland, they were an hour ahead. She said, at five to seven, I woke up to get up for work. And then I thought, we all do this. I'm going to grab another five minutes. And she put her head down for five minutes. And guess what? She had a dream. 
Saint Faustina appeared to her in the dream and said, Maria, pray the rosary every day. Do you see? You see, God has allotted power to the saints. He wants us to rely on their intercession. The gift of faith was needed there, yes, but Saint Faustina did something. So I I recommend devotion. That's why we've got saints' names up. That's why Miles knew the importance. When we were blessing the site, Father Cliff and I, we were calling on the Pacific saint for the tent to bring down blessings, to intercede before the throne of God and ask for the power of God to descend upon that tent. Because the saints have a purpose. Miles Dempsey has a purpose. He said, I'll go before the throne of God and I will intercede for new dawn. And you will receive grace. Not because he was being presumptuous, because he knew God is faithful. So we, we walk, our walk, a life in the Spirit is a life with the saints. And it's the same with Mary. Mary walks with us in our journey. And I remember uh, I was giving a talk in, in uh, the north of England and this lady came up to me at the end and she said, will you pray with me? I said, yes. And then she said, well, my husband is addicted to alcohol and is addicted to marijuana. Um, my marriage is falling apart. Can you pray for him? I said, well, in two weeks' time, I'm going to Fatima. This was in 2017. I said, I'll take an intercession and pray through the intercession of Mary, Our Lady of Fatima, for your husband. So I thought nothing else of it. I went to Fatima. And has anyone ever done the knee walk? Has anyone been to Fatima? Has anyone ever done the knee walk? Miles said to me, don't do that, you're daft. He he was only jealous because he was in the wheelchair and he couldn't do it. I'm sure he did it when he was younger. But I I just want you to visualise it. You you, you walk on your knees. Now, I I don't know why, but I'm sort of walking on my knees like like this. (laughs) Yeah? Every little stone I'm I'm, I'm touching. And these little old women are going... (laughs) You know? And and 14, 15-year-old kids just going past me like a rocket. And I'm thinking, Lord, this is humbling. (laughs) But I knew what the problem was. I was 16, 17 stone and they weren't. <laughs> Knee pressure. But, but you got back to the, the bottom and then someone said to me, you've got to go round the, you know, the cove three times. I, I said, you're joking. <laughs> so I, I'm on the third lap, yeah? Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So I was on the, the Holy Spirit lap, round the back of the cove and I'm on my knees like this and, and, I, and I'm grimacing my knees are cut, the skin's gone, and, and I know you know what I'm talking about here, and everything is an effort. My, my hips were all not working, uh, I had cramp, uh, my back was killing me, oh, tears in my eyes. And then this woman comes running towards me, and there's other people walking, and she's dragging this man with her, and it was the woman that I'd prayed with. Do you see what happened? Was she... When I said I'm going to Fatima to pray to Our Lady for your husband's healing, do you know what she did? She booked a flight. She said, come on. And she dragged him to Fatima. And and she spent four days looking for me. And this was her last night. And she said, I'll just try the cover, see if he's there. And can you imagine what the husband thought? Yeah. He, he, he looked at me as if to say, is he going to heal me? <laughs> and, and you know, I, I don't know if those of you who have done it, you can't straighten your legs when you get up, so, so I'm like this. <laughs> anyway. So, so we, we, we left the sanctuary and I prayed with the guy and I prayed for healing. And you know, I don't know whether the Lord healed him or not, time would tell, but that woman's faith and that man's faith 
pray for them. Because Our Lady walks with us and she called them both to Fatima. I was walking in the Spirit, simply a messenger. Our words that we use are so important. I want to talk about something quite serious, very serious now. Tonight's is all about empowerment. You see, we've, on Monday we were baptised in the Holy Spirit. We are already full of the Holy Spirit, but it can be stifled, it can be uh, sort of contained, and baptism of the Holy Spirit releases, sets free, renews, refreshes all those gifts that we've talked about within. And so, but we've got these gifts now released and refreshed and renewed, what do we do with them? And so tonight's about empowerment. The power of God is within us. But, but for us to connect with that power and realise that power and for that power to be set free. Like a, a notion, like a, a waterfall coming out from us. Power is made perfect in weakness. We read in 2 Corinthians. I want to talk about Christopher, uh, number three, my son. He, when he was 15 years old, got stabbed. And he was paralysed in one leg for a few years because of the stabbing. He very nearly died. He was stabbed with an eight-inch knife in the top of his leg. It was a very traumatic time for the whole family. It was a two or three year court case. It was a difficult time. And it affected Christopher deeply. He hit the drink. He got in trouble with the police for graffiti. And for the next eight years, he was drinking and his life was difficult. He moved out of the family home and he, was, he had a real problem with anxiety. So, you know, he couldn't even go into a shopping market or a church where there was lots of people, he'd have a panic attack. And this went on for a number of years. And then in 2014, he had left the church at the age of 16. He gave up on God. He said, Dad, will you take me to Walsingham? To U2000. And that was in 2014. So... Several of the kids and some of the grandchildren and Chris and we all drove down to Walsingham and we parked up and we saw the big tent like this and Christopher knew what he came for. He was being called by Mary to Walsingham. So we pitched the tent. A priest, Father Chris, Franciscan friar, heard his confession on that side of the tent. It was his first confession since being a a young child, and it changed his life. He started going back to church. He, he's developed his faith. He was connected with various groups. He came to New Dawn in 2016 and 17. He worked with John Martin and Derek uh, to help try and set up the site in 2016. But he was still struggling with anxiety. And then, three months ago, Christopher took his own life. My son. I'm being transparent, but I'm only able to talk to you tonight because of the power of God. This was devastating. This is devastating. The pain I cannot explain. But in the world today, mothers and fathers are losing children in Syria. Mothers and fathers are losing children to drug addiction, alcohol addiction. Mothers and fathers are losing children to knife crime, to gang violence. And what is the answer? Forgiveness. Un people unable to forgive. You know, forgiveness is the key to the power of God. Because the power of God was unlocked when Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the power of the cross. Pentecost 
The power comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. The day after we found Christopher's body, my lad said to me, Dad, we need to go out for a pint. And so we all went out. And when we walked in the pub, this was, coincidentally, this is three months ago tonight, the 8th of May. We walked into the pub and I couldn't believe what I'd seen. The lad who stabbed Christopher 12 years earlier was in the pub. But even in the darkest times of your life, we're called to walk in the Spirit. And I said to my lad, Jesus is speaking to me. I've got to go and say, I forgive you. Because this lad had stabbed my son and that began a process of 12 years of, of, of difficulty which culminated in his death. And I said to my two sons, I said, and one of them is here, I said, I've got to go over. And one of them said, no, dad, don't. Because they were so angry and unforgiving. And I understand that. You know, when I was in my 20s, if someone had done that to my brother, I would have found it very difficult to forgive them. But I said, no. I said, I know I've got to go over. Because Christopher said to me only a few months before, dad, if I ever met the lad that stabbed me, and he, and he, he, he never met him, he said, I wish I had the courage to go up and say, I forgive you. But I didn't want to because in case he hit me. And so with that in mind, I went over to the lad and I said, I forgive you. And I put my hand out to, to the lad who was 26 or 27 now. I said, I forgive you. And he shook my hand. They said, I'm sorry for your loss. And I shook the father's hand. You see, that's where the power is seated. That's where the power of God rests in our forgiveness, in our brokenness, in our weakness. This is so important. Daniela, my daughter, six months earlier had given me a word. She got a word. What she was doing was she was going around the community, uh, praying about it and putting words on people's bedroom doors. So I have a bedroom at the Prince of Peace. And she put on words, because she knew I liked St. Faustina, she put these words on. Prepare for great battles. Know that you are now on a great stage where all heaven and earth are watching you. Fight like a knight so that I can reward you. Do not be unduly fearful because you are not alone. And these words were echoing in my soul. I was involved in a prison ministry and I was due to go in and be involved in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the prisoners. We were completing a six-week course. It was week five. We were baptizing the Spirit. But I felt crushed. I tried to pray in tongues and nothing was coming out. I've been praying in tongues for over 20 years and it was dead. My heart was broken. There was nothing there. And I'm saying, Lord, how can I pray over people like this? But Simon, led by the Lord, said, no, Gary, come in. And I even said to him as we walked into the prison, my spirit is crushed, Simon. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do in here. But then when I saw the lads, one of them had tears in his eyes. He said, I'm sorry they'd been told about Christopher. You see, because many of those lads in the prison... I've been there. You know, some of them are, are desperate. Some of them have thought about it. They have addictions and they needed me. And the Lord was saying, get up. Get up off the floor, get up. It was almost as if I could hear my mum and dad who have gone to the Lord, my ancestors right back to Adam, the angels, the saints, Miles, saying, Gary, Get up and fight like a knight. Amen? Amen? You see, we carry pain, but that's no excuse for not fighting. Isn't the pain our source? Isn't the source of the power of God on the cross? And this is so important for tonight, because we all have brokenness. We all have weakness. And, and that weakness that you have 
is the source of the power of God. That's where the power of God is going to rest on you tonight. In those trials, in those temptations, in those battles with vices, the Lord reminds us that we are human. He doesn't take some things away. We can ask 20 times, 100 times, why do I still have it? Because you need it. Because it's making you whole. It's like peeling an onion. It brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? And so this, this, the trials, the suffering, the temptations, the battles that we have, the children that may be taking drugs, that have left the faith, the grandchildren that haven't been baptised, our children that are in relationships that we disagree with, these are the seating points for God's power. Amen. Amen. Amen? So we shouldn't run around to priests and say, take it away, take it away, pray for take it away. Yes, the serenity prayer. Give me the serenity to, uh, to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We're wise, are we? We must know by now what God has permitted for our sanctification. Yes? So if someone you love is not being the person you want them to be, that's an opportunity for the power of God. And I'm giving witness tonight to something that's very deep and very, very painful. Please pray for my wife, Joanne, Christopher's mother, who gave birth to Christopher. We need your prayers. Miles's mantle is heavy. Miles knew about suffering. He was able to do 32 years of New Dawn because of his suffering was the resting place for the power of God through him. Power is made perfect in weakness. We all have weakness. And so I walked into the prison with Simon and I really didn't have a clue what was going to happen. I thought Simon would do the prayers. I thought I'd be just an observer. And when I got in there and saw the lads, they needed me in that moment. And I, Simon says, I dived across the table to jump on them to pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit flowed. I was praying in the Spirit. And that day, they were praying in tongues. That one lad said to me after it, he said, the week after, he said, do you know what, I can now go to bed at night, I wake up at three o'clock, I pray the rosary, and then I start praying in tongues. The Lord is good. <laughs> Another Polish lad said, I've got tingles in my hands. I said to him, well, that could be a sign of healing. He said, my wife's been telling me that for years. <laughs> See, the wives are always right, you know. And so each of the five or six men that were around the table were all gifted and uh, charisms for mission were released the week after. That group was formed into a men of St. Joseph group. And they are now evangelising in the prison as men of St. Joseph. You see, we are subjected to every kind of hardship but never distressed. We see no way out, but never despair. We are pursued, but never cut off. Knocked down, but still have some life in us. Do you have life in you? Yes. Amen. I have been crucified with Christ and the life I now live is not my own it is Christ living in me. Allow the power of the Holy Spirit to rest in your weakness tonight. You see, God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chooses what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Be empowered in your weakness. Power is made perfect in weakness. I think it was Saint Louis Marie de Montfort who said that a person who has a lot of trials and suffers a lot of temptations is most holy. Do you suffer trials and temptations? Yes. Well, you're being made holy. 
This is why Jesus was attracted to the downtrodden, the brokenhearted, and the Pharisees, he wasn't really attracted to, well, he was. He died for them too. But he was attracted to the ones who were suffering because Jesus knew they were holy. Do you understand? So don't condemn yourself. This isn't Jansenism. God does love you. And you know what? He loves you in your weakness. He loves you in your weakness and he loves you in that weakness and he wants to place his spirit, his power in that weakness because power is made perfect in weakness. Give the Lord permission tonight to rest his power in your weakness. So we've got Nicola Phoenix here. Nicola, how many times have you been to New Dawn? Um, for the last 27 years. Wow. And what is it about New Dawn that keeps on bringing you back? Firstly, because like, I've been coming every year and um, is a massive part of my conversion. Wow. So like I really met like Jesus when I first came to New Dawn. I was just at the beginning of my journey and I felt like I'd arrived in heaven. And wow. then I like, obviously I've met my husband. So he had a big conversion and New Dawn again was all part of that. Okay. And then as we've gone on to have children, um, they just, they just love it. They come, they love like spending time with the friends. Obviously they've got like ministry that's suited to them. And um, for them, it's like the best week of their year. And that's like from the, the youngest up to the oldest. So there's like so many reasons, so many reasons. Here, what's it like bringing your kids to something like this? Oh, that is like so important. Um, Cause like bringing the kids here is like showing them that this is the way that, that, that we're, we're called to live not like the way it is at home or when you're at school and listening to your friends and, and following like that, the, the culture of the world, yeah. that, that that's basically lies and this is the truth. So because like they have this and they have this uh, amongst other things throughout the year, they know that this is the truth yes. and they just really want to hold on to that. And it's good because it's like you bring them here and it's like firing them back up, yeah. like charging their batteries back yeah. up as well as, as, as your own. And so New Dawn, is a five-day conference. What would you say would be the highlight of Newton for you each year? For me personally, the, the all-night adoration. I have like seven kids, yeah. six of them that, that, that are here with us, yeah. and um, it's really, really busy. It's so full on because there's so much going on with, you know, taking the kids to di the different stuff and ha having time to go to your own workshops. So in the evening when the kids are finished and you've kind of got them settled down, I can head over to the chapel and just sit with, with the Lord. And that is my absolute highlight. I love that. Love it. That sounds excellent. Well, thank you so much, Nicola. You've been great. Well done. Thank you very much. Hello World TV is an impressive enterprise. Using the modern means of communication brings to our world the gospel of Jesus Christ. May their work of evangelization through means of communication be a blessing for all. I commend to you the work and the message especially of Shalom World TV. Their mission is to be fruitful and blessed. They in their own lives, as well as those to whom they proclaim the gospel. They are to have blessing. They are to know peace. And to all, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love this day and forever. Amen.